This week, Reverend Wendy begins a short series based on the book, Three Essential Prayers. This talk, entitled Help, focuses on what it means when we pray to the divine for assistance and how surrendering can be an important part of the process. So we're going to talk today and for the next couple of Sundays, actually, whenever I say that, I think that's so ridiculous because I'm talking and hopefully you're listening, not just to me, but to whatever's going on in, inside of you, to your own still small voice of truth that speaks to you as, as you listen to me. But we're going to, going to be looking at the topic of prayer. And I, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Anne Lamott. Raise your hand if you are. I like her. She's an author. She's an activist. She teaches writing classes. She writes in just a very real, accessible way. Every book she's written has become a New York Times bestseller. And I found this book some time ago called Help, Thanks, Wow, The Three Essential Prayers by Anne Lamott. Help, Thanks, <clears throat> wow. I like things simple. Do you like things simple? Our mind tends to make things way more complicated than it needs. they need to be. We oftentimes overthink a lot of stuff. And there are many times in our life where I think we just need to stop. We need to approach things with a more simple, clear mind and open heart. And says, I do not know much about God and prayer, But I have come to believe over the last 25 years that there is something to be said about keeping prayer simple. Help, thanks, wow. Say that with me. Help, thanks, wow. So today we're going to be focusing on the prayer of help. The prayer of help. You know, the very word help can bring up so many different feelings for for us. It can bring up feelings of vulnerability, it can bring up feelings of pain, it can bring up feelings of fear, feelings of frustration. And the whole idea of prayer can be confusing for many of us, depending upon what kind of religious bringing, if any, we grew up with. And so I wanna make sure that we get kind of on the same starting point today as we begin to, to, to study and go deeper into this idea of prayer, this tool, this spiritual practice that can truly change our lives if we use it on a regular and consistent basis. Unity began as a prayer movement. It began as a result of prayer. It was founded in the late 1800s by Charles and Myrtle Fillmore, and it was founded directly because of the result of prayer. Directly because of the result of prayer. Myrtle Fillmore had been diagnosed in her early 40s with terminal tuberculosis, very common in that time period and extremely dangerous. And she was given a very short time to live, very serious prognosis. She was a mother, she was married, she was motivated to get well. And she and her husband Charles pursued everything they could possibly think of that was available at the time for her to be cured of tuberculosis. And eventually what it was that turned her life around was the act of prayer. She had heard a statement in a lecture that went contrary to the way she had been taught to think of herself as a young child. She had been taught to think of herself as frail and weak and likely to inherit sickness, and lo and behold, she did, the tuberculosis that she was diagnosed with in her 40s. But in this lecture, she heard something that was completely different than that. She had heard an idea that she inherits health and well-being from God. And that was such a fundamentally different idea for her, so opposite to the way she had held herself. And she began to work with that idea, with that single idea, over and over and over and over again in her mind and in her heart. She began to, as what we call it in unity now, to pray affirmatively. She knew she needed help, and she went and she sought help where she could find it, and then she worked with the response she got from her request for help. She worked with that response in an attitude of affirmative prayer, as well as in the practice of what we call the silence in unity. The silence in unity is very much like what we would do in meditation. 
Prayer tends to be the talking to spirit, if you will. Meditation tends to be the listening to and for spirit. I like the way Anne Lamott in this book defines prayer. She says, prayer is communication between the heart and the divine. It is seeking union with the divine. Let me repeat that. It is communication between the heart and the divine. It is seeking union with the divine. Communication between the heart and the divine. These prayers help, thanks, wow, in many ways are at the basis of any of the things that cause us to want to pray in the first place. This idea of help is the idea that there's a point in our lives, in fact, for some of us, many points in our lives, where we feel overwhelmed, where we feel like we're in a situation that we just don't know how to deal with or how to get past. Our own best thinking has brought us right to where we are now and can't take us any further. And we feel, help, help, help me find a way beyond, help me find a way through. Something's not working here. The kind of prayer that we want to to practice is a kind of prayer that lives in our heart, our soul, and our very gut. It's not the prayer that lives in our minds. Many of us in this room grew up with a certain approach to prayer that was much more formal and often very rote. I know for me, growing up here in San Diego and being confirmed in a very small, lovely Lutheran church, that my concept of prayer was something that, number one, you memorized, and it needed to be said a certain way, and you, you needed to say it that way all of the time, and that it was kind of like your calling card. You knew you were into that church or into that religion if you knew what those prayers were, and you said them right. Nod your head if you know what I'm talking about. And, you know, as a young person learning the prayer, it was kind of like that moment when you finally get it and you go, oh, now I'm like an adult. I can sit here and I can, I can say the same words that everybody else is saying. And then eventually, for many of us, it becomes very rote very empty. It's like we say it, but while we're saying it, we're thinking something else. We're doing something else. Our mind is somewhere else. Our heart is somewhere else. It's a little bit like driving home from work the same way you drive home every single day, pulling into your driveway and going, wait a minute, how did I get here? And I'm not talking about if you've had too much to drink. I'm talking about sober, getting there, going, wait a minute, how did I get there? You got there because you did what? It was on automatic pilot, right? You just, you've done it so many times. You got there, and that's okay, as long as you're paying attention. It's okay that you got home that way. But in prayer, if our prayer is just that formal, rote repetition of somebody else's words, I want to say that's not going to bring about the change that we're usually after that causes us to fall to our knees, literally or figuratively, to pray in the first place. That is a different kind of prayer. And it's a kind of prayer that's got to be felt in the heart and in the soul and in the very gut, if you will. And of all of these three prayers, the one that I think brings us to our knees, so to speak, and is really felt in the, in the gut, is that spontaneous prayer that we almost shout out at the universe, help. Have you ever done that? Have you ever gotten to a place in your life where you just, and maybe it wasn't a shout out, but it was that strong feeling inside, help me. Nod your head if you know. Right, right. And what brought you there? And I'm not talking about the external circumstances that brought you there. But what brought you, I bet, to that, that soul scream for help was you were at the very edge of what you knew to do. And that everything that you had done up to that point had worked to a certain extent, but it didn't get you where you needed to be. It didn't bring about the healing or it didn't bring about the resolution or the solving of whatever it was that was going on. And you were screaming on a soul level, help, help. We have a problem, I believe, in our society, to a certain extent we do, 
We associate the request for help with weakness. We so value being strong and independent that we've taken that to such an extreme, I believe, that to ask for help almost feels as if we're admitting failure. Admitting we just can't do it, which is true, that's why we're asking for help, but then we layer onto ourselves that somehow that is wrong. And what I want to leave us with in this message is that it is healthy and absolutely important and a sign of emotional and spiritual strength and maturity to ask for help when we need it. Asking for help of the divine, asking for help of our higher power, asking for help from spirit, whatever you call that presence, wants to be as easy and natural and automatic for us when we need it as asking for help when we need to lift something heavy that's too heavy for us to do on our own. What do we do? We ask for help from another person, right? And we know that if we ask for it and that person is available, is capable, what are they going to do? They're going to help us, right? There's a statement in the New Testament. I don't remember what book it's in. But the statement is, you have not because you ask not. That comes back to me in my life so many times because I surprise myself at the times I forget to ask for help, whether it's help from another or help from God. I was teaching one of the step classes this past Wednesday, and the class was on seeking and, and following divine guidance. And we talked about the difference between intuition and guidance. And the, the sharing that happens in these classes is very rewarding and very rich to me. I learn as much from the questions and the comments that the students share as anything that I've prepared to teach. And as we were talking about this idea, the difference between intuition and divine guidance, one of the students said, oh my gosh, I got it. I have always felt comfortable with intuition. I recognize my own intuition. I recognize when spirit or something is, is intuitively giving me a message. But what I also realize is that I never think to ask to be guided. I always think I have to figure it out myself. Does anybody else have a mind that works like that sometimes? You know, as, as I've said, as a society, we tend to, to look down at the person who asks for help. And that is such, such a shame. Because what we are doing is we are limiting ourselves as a society in being all that we can be. We are limiting ourselves on many different levels when we refuse to admit, I need help. I cannot do this, whatever this may be, all by myself. I need help from another or I need help from spirit. I need help from God with a new idea, with a new inspiration, with a new hope. I need help to get beyond where my own best thinking has brought me. We've raised, at least in our country, to a great extent, a society of, of boys becoming young men who somehow are growing up with the idea that to be a man means you never, ever, ever admit that you can't do something on your own. Do you see the costs that, that, that we're paying for that kind of belief? We're paying a pretty high cost. We're praying, paying a cost in which <clears throat> we're not allowing 50% of our society to be fully whole functioning people, being able to ask for help when help is actually genuinely needed. We are short-circuiting the opportunity for those who can provide help in that particular situation, the beautiful, wonderful opportunity to make a difference and to help. When we refuse to ask for help from God or from anyone else, the consequence is that we will live in a much smaller field of possibility, a very limited field of possibility than if we are willing to be vulnerable and say, I can't do it on my own. I need 
help. I'm willing to ask for help. It was Dwight Eisenhower who said, there are no atheists in foxholes. <laughs> what do you think he meant by that? Because there are certainly people who profess to be atheists, who profess not to believe in God, who actually don't believe in God. To them, I always like to ask the question, tell me the God you don't believe in. And when they describe the kind of God that they don't believe in, I'm usually 100% in agreement. I don't believe, with, believe in that kind of God either. And boy, does that open up a rich conversation. But what was Eisenhower saying? There are no atheists in foxholes. Foxhole is a pretty scary place to be. I've never been in one. I don't ever want to be in one. But I've seen enough documentaries to know how absolutely traumatic and frightening that must be. So what was he saying? There are no atheists in foxholes. He was saying that deep within us there is a knowingness, that there is a power and there is a presence, there is something available to us beyond our own humanity. Call it God, call it spirit, call it the divine mind, call it the universe, doesn't matter what you call it. What we must remember though is that this act of prayer, whether it is the prayer of help or the prayer of thanks or wow that we'll get to in the next couple of weeks, that prayer is fundamentally not about changing God. Prayer is about changing ourselves. Prayer is not about changing God. Prayer is about changing ourselves. God is not a vending machine in the sky. We do not sit in prayer to tell God what we want God to do. That's not what we understand prayer to be in our spiritual metaphysical teaching. I grew up with that belief, not so much that God was a vending machine in the sky, but I grew up with the belief that I prayed to get God to do something for me, to get God to fix something for me, to get God to heal something for me. Not your head if you grew up at all with that kind of prayer. I prayed to God for that, or I prayed to God to be forgiven. But I prayed to God for God to do something. It was not until I found unity that I understood there is a whole different understanding of prayer. And that prayer is not to change God, to get God to do something. Prayer is to change me. Oh, it was so much easier than the other belief. <laughs> I just thought I had to wait. And if I just said the right prayers in the right way, in the right language, in the right number of times, that reluctant God would finally hear me over everybody else and do what I asked that reluctant, distant God to do. Prayer is an activity to change us and to change us at depth. The prayer help, ooh, what a cool <laughs> message. The prayer help is an admission that I'm at the end of what I know how to do and I can't go the rest of the way, whatever that is, on my own. It is the understanding that there is something I must let go of, let go of my false beliefs, let go of my feeling of control, and let something in. It is the prayer that says, break open my mind, break open my heart, break open my consciousness, that I might see beyond where I am now, and in seeing beyond where I am now, will have the strength and courage to make the change in consciousness that I must make. This 12-step program, the recovery movement, is hugely successful. And it is successful because it is effective. And it is effective for many different reasons and on many different levels. But one of the starting points in recovery is the admission of helplessness, the admission of powerlessness, the admission of, I can't do this all by myself. And then it is the yielding into, the letting go, the surrendering to a higher presence and a power working through us to change us. Does that make sense? Working through us 
to change us. This is what Anne writes about help. Help is really a prayer of surrender. It is letting go of the need to control the end result. Oh, my goodness. It means trusting God with the outcome. It is a willingness to turn our eyes from our problems to somewhere else. It is to see differently. Prayer is not a magic wand, although sometimes we act as if it is. It is not a magic wand. It does not change God, but boy, can it change us. As I was looking over my notes this week and was reading my statement, prayer is not a magic wand, I was so surprised when I read my Daily Word this morning. Do any of you read the Daily Word magazine from from Unity? If you read it this morning, this is going to be a repetition for you. Though it says that the word for the day is divine order, I was stunned by a phrase in the message. The order of spirit is always unfolding if I have eyes to see. I may mistakenly focus on appearances. Prayer is not a magic wand, (laughs) but a way for me to change how I see things. It's not a magic wand, but it's a way for me to change how I see things. Prayer is a way for me to change how I see things. Let's say that together. Prayer is a way for me to change how I see things. Before we set things right, I think this is an Emmett Fox quote, before we set things right, we must see things right. Prayer changes our vision. Prayer lifts our vision above the appearance to what is possible. Prayer breaks our consciousness open so we can see beyond where we are right now and allow ourselves to change where we are right now and how we are right now. So the life that flows out of that change is fundamentally different. That is how our prayers are answered. Namaste. Many people enjoy Reverend Wendy's talks and meditations and aren't able to attend the Unity Center in person. If you're part of our extended family from around the world and would like to help support the Unity Center, please go to our website or download our free app, which offers even more ways to connect with the Unity Center. Namaste.